section fifteen of state of the union addresses eighteen twenty nine to eighteen thirty six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org andrew jackson december seventh eighteen thirty five part one fellow citizens of the senate and of the house of representatives in the discharge of my official duty the time again devolves upon me of communicating with a new congress the reflection that the representation of the union has been recently renewed and that the constitutional term of its service will expire with my own heightens the solicitude with which i shall attempt to lay before it the state of our national concerns and the devout hope which i cherish that its labours to improve them may be crowned with success you are assembled at a period of profound interest to the american patriot the unexampled growth and prosperity of our country having given us a rank in the scale of nations which removes all apprehension of danger to our integrity and independence from external foes the career of freedom is before us with an earnest desire from the past that if true to ourselves there can be no formidable obstacle in the future to its peaceful and uninterrupted pursuit yet in proportion to the disappearance of those apprehensions which attended our weakness as once contrasted with the power of some of the states of the old world should we now be solicitous as to those which belong to the conviction that it is to our own conduct we must look for the preservation of those causes on which depend the excellence and the duration of our happy system of government in the example of other systems founded on the will of the people we trace to internal dissension the influences which have so often blasted the hopes of the friends of freedom the social elements which were strong and successful when united against external danger failed in the more difficult task of properly adjusting their own internal organization and thus gave way the great principle of self-government let us trust that this admonition will never be forgotten by the government or the people of the united states and that the testimony which our experience thus far holds out to the great human family of the practicability and the blessings of free government will be confirmed in all time to come we have but to look at the state of our agriculture manufactures and commerce and the unexampled increase of our population to feel the magnitude of the trust committed to us never in any former period of our history have we had greater reason than we now have to be thankful to divine providence for the blessings of health and general prosperity every branch of labor we see crowned with the most abundant rewards in every element of national resources and wealth and of individual comfort we witness the most rapid and solid improvements with no interruptions to this pleasing prospect at home which will not yield to the spirit of harmony and good will that so strikingly pervades the mass of the people in every quarter amidst all the diversity of interest and pursuits to which they are attached and with no cause of solicitude in regard to our external affairs which will not it is hoped disappear before the principles of simple justice and the forbearance that mark our intercourse with foreign powers we have every reason to feel proud of our beloved country the general state of our foreign relations has not materially changed since my last annual message in the settlement of the question of the northeastern boundary little progress has been made great britain has declined acceding to the proposition of the united states presented in accordance with the resolution of the senate unless certain preliminary conditions were admitted which i deemed incompatible with a satisfactory and rightful adjustment of the controversy 
waiting for some distinct proposal from the government of great britain which has been invited i can only repeat the expression of my confidence that with the strong mutual disposition which i believe exists to make a just arrangement this perplexing question can be settled with a due regard to the well-founded pretensions and pacific policy of all the parties to it events are frequently occurring on the northeastern frontier of a character to impress upon all the necessity of a speedy and definitive termination of the dispute this consideration added to the desire common to both to relieve the liberal and friendly relations so happily existing between the two countries from all embarrassment will no doubt have its just influence upon both our diplomatic intercourse with portugal has been renewed and it is expected that the claims of our citizens partially paid will be fully satisfied as soon as the condition of the queen's government will permit the proper attention to the subject of them that government has i am happy to inform you manifested a determination to act upon the liberal principles which have marked our commercial policy the happiest effects upon the future trade between the united states and portugal are anticipated from it and the time is not thought to be remote when a system of perfect reciprocity will be established the instalments due under the convention with the king of the two sicilies have been paid with that scrupulous fidelity by which his whole conduct has been characterized and the hope is indulged that the adjustment of the vexed question of our claims will be followed by a more extended and mutually beneficial intercourse between the two countries the internal contest still continues in spain distinguished as this struggle has unhappily been by incidents of the most sanguinary character the obligations of the late treaty of indemnification with us have been nevertheless faithfully executed by the spanish government no provision having been made at the last session of congress for the ascertainment of the claims to be paid and the apportionment of the funds under the convention made with spain i invite your early attention to the subject the public evidences of the debt have according to the terms of the convention and in the forms prescribed by it been placed in the possession of the united states and the interest as it fell due has been regularly paid upon them our commercial intercourse with cuba stands as regulated by the act of congress no recent information has been received as to the disposition of the government of madrid and the lamented death of our recently appointed minister on his way to spain with the pressure of their affairs at home renders it scarcely probable that any change is to be looked for during the coming year further portions of the florida archives have been sent to the united states although the death of one of the commissioners at a critical moment embarrassed the progress of the delivery of them the higher officers of the local government have recently shown an anxious desire in compliance with the orders from the parent government to facilitate the selection and delivery of all we have a right to claim negotiations have been opened at madrid for the establishment of a lasting peace between spain and such of the spanish american governments of this hemisphere as have availed themselves of the intimation given to all of them of the disposition of spain to treat upon the basis of their entire independence it is to be regretted that simultaneous appointments by all of ministers to negotiate with spain had not been made the negotiation itself would have been simplified and this long-standing dispute spreading over a large portion of the world would have been brought to a more speedy conclusion our political and commercial relations with austria prussia sweden and denmark stand on the usual favourable bases one of the articles of our treaty with russia in relation to the trade on the north-west coast of america having expired instructions have been given to our minister at st petersburg to negotiate a renewal of it the long and unbroken amity between the two governments gives every reason for supposing the article will be renewed if stronger motives do not exist to prevent it than with our view of the subject can be anticipated here 
i ask your attention to the message of my predecessor at the opening of the second session of the nineteenth congress relative to our commercial intercourse with holland and to the documents connected with that subject communicated to the house of representatives on the tenth of january eighteen twenty five and eighteenth of january eighteen twenty seven coinciding in the opinion of my predecessor that holland is not under the regulations of her present system entitled to have her vessels and their cargoes received into the united states on the footing of american vessels and cargoes as regards duties of tonnage and impost a respect for his reference of it to the legislature has alone prevented me from acting on the subject i should still have waited without comment for the action of congress but recently a claim has been made by belgian subjects to admission into our ports for their ships and cargoes on the same footing as american with the allegation we could not dispute that our vessels received in their ports the identical treatment shown to them in the ports of holland upon whose vessels no discrimination is made in the ports of the united states given the same privileges the belgians expected the same benefits benefits that were in fact enjoyed when belgium and holland were united under one government satisfied with the justice of their pretension to be placed on the same footing with holland i could not nevertheless without disregard to the principle of our laws admit their claim to be treated as americans and at the same time a respect for congress to whom the subject had long since been referred has prevented me from producing a just equality by taking from the vessels of holland privileges conditionally granted by acts of congress although the condition upon which the grant was made has in my judgment failed since eighteen twenty two i recommend therefore a review of the act of eighteen twenty four and such modification of it as will produce an equality on such terms as congress shall think best comports with our settled policy and the obligations of justice to two friendly powers with the sublime port and all the governments on the coast of barbary our relations continue to be friendly the proper steps have been taken to renew our treaty with morocco the argentine republic has again promised to send within the current year a minister to the united states a convention with mexico for extending the time for the appointment of commissioners to run the boundary line has been concluded and will be submitted to the senate recent events in that country have awakened the liveliest solicitude in the united states aware of the strong temptations existing and powerful inducements held out to the citizens of the united states to mingle in the dissensions of our immediate neighbors instructions have been given to the district attorneys of the united states where indications warranted it to prosecute without respect to persons all who might attempt to violate the obligations of our neutrality while at the same time it has been thought necessary to apprise the government of mexico that we should require the integrity of our territory to be scrupulously respected by both parties from our diplomatic agents in brazil chile peru central america venezuela and new granada constant assurances are received of the continued good understanding with the governments to which they are severally accredited with those governments upon which our citizens have valid and accumulating claims scarcely an advance toward a settlement of them is made owing mainly to their distracted state or to the pressure of imperative domestic questions our patience has been and will probably be still further severely tried but our fellow-citizens whose interests are involved may confide in the determination of the government to obtain for them eventually ample retribution unfortunately many of the nations of this hemisphere are still self-tormented by domestic dissensions revolution succeeds revolution injuries are committed upon foreigners engaged in lawful pursuits much time elapses before a government sufficiently stable is erected to justify expectation of redress 
ministers are sent and received and before the discussions of past injuries are fairly begun fresh troubles arise but too frequently new injuries are added to the old to be discussed together with the existing government after it has proved its ability to sustain the assaults made upon it or with its successor if overthrown if this unhappy condition of things continues much longer other nations will be under the painful necessity of deciding whether justice to their suffering citizens does not require a prompt redress of injuries by their own power without waiting for the establishment of a government competent and enduring enough to discuss and to make satisfaction for them since the last session of congress the validity of our claims upon france as liquidated by the treaty of eighteen thirty one has been acknowledged by both branches of her legislature and the money has been appropriated for their discharge but the payment is i regret to inform you still withheld a brief recapitulation of the most important incidents in this protracted controversy will show how utterly untenable are the grounds upon which this course is attempted to be justified on entering upon the duties of my station i found the united states an unsuccessful applicant to the justice of france for the satisfaction of claims the validity of which was never questionable and has now been most solemnly admitted by france herself the antiquity of these claims their high justice and the aggravating circumstances out of which they arose are too familiar to the american people to require description it is sufficient to say that for a period of ten years and upward our commerce was with but little interruption the subject of constant aggression on the part of france aggressions the ordinary features of which were condemnations of vessels and cargoes under arbitrary decrees adopted in contravention as well of the laws of nations as of treaty stipulations burnings on the high seas and seizures and confiscations under special imperial rescripts in the ports of other nations occupied by the armies or under the control of france such it is now conceded is the character of the wrongs we suffered wrongs in many cases so flagrant that even their authors never denied our right to reparation of the extent of these injuries some conception may be formed from the fact that after the burning of a large amount at sea and the necessary deterioration in other cases by long detention the american property so seized and sacrificed at forced sales excluding what was adjudged to privateers before or without condemnation brought into the french treasury upward of twenty four million francs besides large custom-house duties the subject had already been an affair of twenty years uninterrupted negotiation except for a short time when france was overwhelmed by the military power of united europe during this period whilst other nations were extorting from her payment of their claims at the point of the bayonet the united states intermitted their demand for justice out of respect to the oppressed condition of a gallant people to whom they felt under obligations for fraternal assistance in their own days of suffering and peril the bad effects of these protracted and unavailing discussions were obvious and the line of duty was to my mind equally so this was either to insist upon the adjustment of our claims within a reasonable period or to abandon them altogether i could not doubt that by this course the interests and honour of both countries would be best consulted instructions were therefore given in this spirit to the minister who was sent out once more to demand reparation upon the meeting of congress in december eighteen twenty nine i felt it my duty to speak of these claims and the delays of france in terms calculated to call the serious attention of both countries to the subject the then french ministry took exemption to the message on the ground of its containing a menace under it was not agreeable to the french government to negotiate 
the american minister of his own accord refuted the construction which was attempted to be put upon the message and at the same time called to the recollection of the french ministry that the president's message was a communication addressed not to foreign governments but to the congress of the united states in which it was enjoined upon him by the constitution to lay before that body information of the state of the union comprehending its foreign as well as its domestic relations and that if in the discharge of this duty he felt it incumbent upon him to summon the attention of congress in due time to what might be the possible consequences of existing difficulties with any foreign government he might fairly be supposed to do so under a sense of his own government and not from any intention of holding a menace over a foreign power the views taken by him received my approbation the french government was satisfied and the negotiation was continued it terminated in the treaty of july fourth recognizing the justice of our claims in part and promising payment to the amount of twenty five million francs in six annual instalments the ratifications of this treaty were exchanged at washington on the second of february eighteen thirty two and in five days thereafter it was laid before congress who immediately passed the acts necessary on our part to secure to france the commercial advantages conceded to her in the compact the treaty had previously been solemnly ratified by the king of the french in terms which are certainly not mere matters of form and of which the translation is as follows we approving the above convention in all and each of the dispositions which are contained in it do declare by ourselves as well as by our heirs and successors that it is accepted approved ratified and confirmed and by these presents signed by our hand we do accept approve ratify and confirm it promising on the faith and word of a king to observe it and to cause it to be observed inviolably without ever contravening it or suffering it to be contravened directly or indirectly for any cause or under any pretense whatsoever official information of the exchange of ratifications in the united states reached paris whilst the chambers were in session the extraordinary and to us injurious delays of the french government in their action upon the subject of its fulfilment have been heretofore stated to congress and i have no disposition to enlarge upon them here it is sufficient to observe that the then pending session was allowed to expire without even an effort to obtain the necessary appropriations that the two succeeding ones were also suffered to pass away without anything like a serious attempt to obtain a decision upon the subject and that it was not until the fourth session almost three years after the conclusion of the treaty and more than two years after the exchange of ratifications that the bill for the execution of the treaty was pressed to a vote and rejected in the meantime the government of the united states having full confidence that a treaty entered into and so solemnly ratified by the french king would be executed in good faith and not doubting that provision would be made for the payment of the first instalment which was to become due on the second day of february eighteen thirty three negotiated a draft for the amount through the bank of the united states when this draft was presented by the holder with the credentials required by the treaty to authorize him to receive the money the government of france allowed it to be protested in addition to the injury in the non-payment of the money by france conformably to her engagement the united states were exposed to a heavy claim on the part of the bank under pretence of damages in satisfaction of which that institution seized upon and still retains an equal amount of the public money congress was in session when the decision of the chambers reached washington and an immediate communication of this apparently final decision of france not to fulfil the stipulation of the treaty was the course naturally to be expected from the president the deep tone of dissatisfaction which pervaded the public mind and the correspondent excitement produced in congress by only a general knowledge of the result rendered it more than probable that a resort to immediate measures of redress would be the consequence of calling the attention of that body to the subject 
sincerely desirous of preserving the pacific relations which had so long existed between the two countries i was anxious to avoid this course if i could be satisfied that by so neither the interest nor the honour of my country would be compromitted without the fullest assurances on that point i could not hope to acquit myself of the responsibility to be incurred in suffering congress to adjourn without laying the subject before them those received by me were believed to be of that character that the feelings produced in the united states by the news of the rejection of the appropriation would be such as i have described them to have been was foreseen by the french government and prompt measures were taken by it to prevent the consequence the king in person expressed through our minister at paris his profound regret at the decision of the chambers and promised to send forthwith a ship with dispatches to his minister here authorizing him to give such assurances as would satisfy the government and people of the united states that the treaty would yet be faithfully executed by france the national ship arrived and the minister received his instructions claiming to act under the authority derived from them he gave to this government in the name of his the most solemn assurances that as soon after the new elections as the charter would permit the french chambers would be convened and the attempt to procure the necessary appropriations renewed that all the constitutional powers of the king and his ministers should be put in requisition to accomplish the object and he was understood and so expressly informed by this government at the time to engage that the question should be pressed to a decision at a period sufficiently early to permit information of the result to be communicated to congress at the commencement of their next session relying upon these assurances i incurred the responsibility great as i regarded it to be of suffering congress to separate without communicating with them upon the subject the expectations justly founded upon the promises thus solemnly made to this government by that of france were not realized the french chambers met on the thirty first of july eighteen thirty four soon after the election and although our minister in paris urged the french ministry to bring the subject before them they declined doing so he next insisted that the chambers of prorogued without acting on the subject should be reassembled at a period so early that their action on the treaty might be known in washington prior to the meeting of congress this reasonable request was not only declined but the chambers were prorogued to the twenty ninth of december a day so late that their decision however urgently pressed could not in all probability be obtained in time to reach washington before the necessary adjournment of congress by the constitution the reasons given by the ministry for refusing to convoke the chambers at an earlier period were afterwards shown not to be insuperable by their actual convocation on the first of december under a special call for domestic purposes which fact however did not become known to this government until after the commencement of the last session of congress thus disappointed in our just expectations it became my imperative duty to consult with congress in regard to the expediency of a resort to retaliatory measures in case the stipulations of the treaty should not be speedily complied with and to recommend such as in my judgment the occasion called for to this end an unreserved communication of the case in all its aspects became indispensable to have shrunk in making it from saying all that was necessary to its correct understanding and that the truth would justify for fear of giving offence to others would have been unworthy of us to have gone on the other hand a single step further for the purpose of wounding the pride of a government and people with whom we had so many motives for cultivating relations of amity and reciprocal advantage would have been unwise and improper admonished by the past of the difficulty of making even the simplest statement of our wrongs without disturbing the sensibilities of those who had by their position become responsible for their redress and earnestly desirous of preventing further obstacles from that source i went out of my way to preclude a construction of the message by which the recommendation that was made to congress might be regarded as a menace to france in not only disavowing such a design but in declaring that her pride and her power were too well known to expect anything from her fears 
the message did not reach paris until more than a month after the chambers had been in session and such was the insensibility of the ministry to our rightful claims and just expectations that our minister had been informed that the matter when introduced would not be pressed as a cabinet measure although the message was not officially communicated to the french government and notwithstanding the declaration to the contrary which it contained the french ministry decided to consider the conditional recommendation of reprisals a menace and an insult which the honour of the nation made it incumbent on them to resent the measures resorted to by them to evince their sense of the supposed indignity were the immediate recall of their minister at washington the offer of passports to the american minister at paris and a public notice to the legislative chambers that all diplomatic intercourse with the united states had been suspended having in this manner vindicated the dignity of france they next proceeded to illustrate her justice to this end a bill was immediately introduced into the chamber of deputies proposing to make the appropriations necessary to carry into effect the treaty as this bill subsequently passed into a law the provisions of which now constitute the main subject of difficulty between the two nations it becomes my duty in order to place the subject before you in a clear light to trace the history of its passage and to refer with some particularity to the proceedings and discussions in regard to it the minister of finance in his opening speech alluded to the measures which had been adopted to resent the supposed indignity and recommended the execution of the treaty as a measure required by the honour and justice of france he as the organ of the ministry declared the message so long as it had not received the sanction of congress a mere expression of the personal opinion of the president for which neither the government nor people of the united states were responsible and that an engagement had been entered into for the fulfilment of which the honour of france was pledged entertaining these views the single condition which the french ministry proposed to annex to the payment of the money was that it should not be made until it was ascertained that the government of the united states had done nothing to injure the interests of france or in other words that no steps had been authorized by congress of a hostile character toward france what the disposition of action of congress might be was then unknown to the french cabinet but on the fourteenth day of january the senate resolved that it was at that time inexpedient to adopt any legislative measures in regard to the state of affairs between the united states and france and no action on the subject had occurred in the house of representatives these facts were known in paris prior to the twenty eighth of march eighteen thirty five when the committee to whom the bill of indemnification had been referred reported it to the chamber of deputies that committee substantially re-echoed the sentiments of the ministry declared that congress had set aside the proposition of the president and recommended the passage of the bill without any other restriction than that originally proposed thus was it known to the french ministry and chambers that if the position assumed by them and which had been so frequently and solemnly announced as the only one compatible with the honour of france was maintained and the bill passed as originally proposed the money would be paid and there would be an end of this unfortunate controversy but this cheering prospect was soon destroyed by an amendment introduced into the bill at the moment of its passage providing that the money should not be paid until the french government had received satisfactory explanations of the president's message of the second december eighteen thirty four and what is still more extraordinary the president of the council of ministers adopted this amendment and consented to its incorporation in the bill in regard to a supposed insult which had been formally resented by the recall of their minister and the offer of passports to ours they now for the first time proposed to ask explanations sentiments and propositions which they had declared could not justly be imputed to the government or people of the united states are set up as obstacles to the performance of an act of conceded justice to that government and people they had declared that the honour of france required the fulfilment of the engagement into which the king had entered unless congress adopted the recommendations of the message they ascertained that congress did not adopt them 
and yet that fulfilment is refused unless they first obtain from the president explanations of an opinion characterized by themselves as personal and inoperative the conception that it was my intention to menace or insult the government of france is as unfounded as the attempt to extort from the fears of that nation what her sense of justice may deny would be vain and ridiculous but the constitution of the united states imposes on the president the duty of laying before congress the condition of the country in its foreign and domestic relations and of recommending such measures as may in his opinion be required by its interests from the performance of this duty he cannot be deterred by the fear of wounding the sensibilities of the people or government of whom it may become necessary to speak and the american people are incapable of submitting to an interference by any government on earth however powerful with the free performance of the domestic duties which the constitution has imposed on their public functionaries the discussions which intervene between the several departments of our government being to ourselves and for anything said in them our public servants are only responsible to their own constituents and to each other if in the course of their consultations facts are erroneously stated or unjust deductions are made they require no other inducement to correct them however informed of their error than their love of justice and what is due to their own character but they can never submit to be interrogated upon the subject as a matter of right by a foreign power when our discussions terminate in acts our responsibility to foreign powers commences not as individuals but as a nation the principle which calls in question the president for the language of his message would equally justify a foreign power in demanding explanations of the language used in the report of a committee or by a member in debate this is not the first time that the government of france has taken exception to the messages of american presidents president washington and the first president adams in the performance of their duties to the american people fell under the animadversions of the french directory the objection taken by the ministry of charles x and removed by the explanation made by our minister upon the spot has already been adverted to when it was understood that the ministry of the present king took exception to my message of last year putting a construction upon it which was disavowed on its face our late minister at paris in answer to the note which first announced a dissatisfaction with the language used in the message made a communication to the french government under date of the twenty ninth of january eighteen thirty five calculated to remove all impressions which an unreasonable susceptibility had created he repeated and called the attention of the french government to the disavowal contained in the message itself of any intention to intimidate by menace he truly declared that it contained and was intended to contain no charge of ill faith against the king of the french and properly distinguished between the right to complain in unexceptionable terms of the omission to execute an agreement and an accusation of bad motives in withholding such execution and demonstrated that the necessary use of that right ought not to be considered as an offensive imputation although this communication was made without instructions and entirely on the minister's own responsibility yet it was afterwards made the act of this government by my full approbation and that approbation was officially made known on the twenty fifth of april eighteen thirty five to the french government it however failed to have any effect the law after this friendly explanation passed with the obnoxious amendment supported by the king's ministers and was finally approved by the king the people of the united states are justly attached to a pacific system in their intercourse with foreign nations it is proper therefore that they should know whether their government has adhered to it in the present instance it has been carried to the utmost extent that was consistent with a becoming self-respect the note of the twenty ninth of january to which i have before alluded was not the only one which our minister took upon himself the responsibility of presenting on the same subject and in the same spirit 
finding that it was intended to make the payment of a just debt dependent on the performance of a condition which he knew could never be complied with he thought it a duty to make another attempt to convince the french government that whilst self-respect and regard to the dignity of other nations would always prevent us from using any language that ought to give offence yet we could never admit a right in any foreign government to ask explanations of or to interfere in any manner in the communications which one branch of our public councils made with another that in the present case no such language had been used and that this had in a former note been fully and voluntarily stated before it was contemplated to make the explanation a condition and that there might be no misapprehension he stated the terms used in that note and he officially informed them that it had been approved by the president and that therefore every explanation which could reasonably be asked or honourably given had been already made that the contemplated measure had been anticipated by a voluntary and friendly declaration and was therefore not only useless but might be deemed offensive and certainly would not be complied with if annexed as a condition when this latter communication to which i especially invite the attention of congress was laid before me i entertained the hope that the means it was obviously intended to afford of an honourable and speedy adjustment of the difficulties between the two nations would have been accepted and i therefore did not hesitate to give it my sanction and full approbation this was due to the minister who had made himself responsible for the act and it was published to the people of the united states and is now laid before their representatives to show how far their executive has gone in its endeavours to restore a good understanding between the two countries it would have been at any time communicated to the government of france had it been officially requested the french government having received all the explanation which honour and principle permitted and which could in reason be asked it was hoped it would no longer hesitate to pay the instalments now due the agent authorised to receive the money was instructed to inform the french minister of his readiness to do so in reply to this notice he was told that the money could not then be paid because the formalities required by the act of the chambers had not been arranged not having received any official information of the intentions of the french government and anxious to bring as far as practicable this unpleasant affair to a close before the meeting of congress that you might have the whole subject before you i caused our charge d'affaires at paris to be instructed to ask for the final determination of the french government and in the event of their refusal to pay the instalments now due without further explanations to return to the united states the result of this last application has not yet reached us but is daily expected that it may be favourable is my sincere wish france having now through all the branches of her government acknowledged the validity of our claims and the obligation of the treaty of eighteen thirty one and there really existing no adequate cause for further delay will at length it may be hoped adopt the course which the interests of both nations not less than the principles of justice so imperiously require the treaty being once executed on her part little will remain to disturb the friendly relations of the two countries nothing indeed which will not yield to the suggestions of a pacific and enlightened policy and to the influence of that mutual good will and of those generous recollections which we may confidently expect will then be revived in all their ancient force End of section fifteen section sixteen of state of the union addresses eighteen twenty nine to eighteen thirty six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org andrew jackson december seventh eighteen thirty five part two in any event however the principle involved in the new aspect which has been given to the controversy is so vitally important to the independent administration of the government that it can neither be surrendered nor compromitted without national degradation 
i hope it is unnecessary for me to say that such a sacrifice will not be made through any agency of mine the honour of my country shall never be stained by an apology from me for the statement of truth and the performance of duty nor can i give any explanation of my official acts except such as is due to integrity and justice and consistent with the principles on which our institutions have been framed this determination will i am confident be approved by my constituents i have indeed studied their character to but little purpose if the sum of twenty-five million francs will have the weight of a feather in the estimation of what appertains to their national independence and if unhappily a different impression should at any time obtain in any quarter they will i am sure rally round the government of their choice with alacrity and unanimity and silence for ever the degrading imputation having thus frankly presented to you the circumstances which since the last session of congress have occurred in this interesting and important matter with the views of the executive in regard to them it is at this time only necessary to add that whenever the advices now daily expected from our charge d'affaires shall have been received they will be made the subject of a special communication the condition of the public finances was never more flattering than at the present period since my last annual communication all the remains of the public debt have been redeemed or money has been placed in deposit for this purpose whenever the creditors choose to receive it all the other pecuniary engagements of the government have been honourably and promptly fulfilled and there will be a balance in the treasury at the close of the year of about nineteen million dollars it is believed that after meeting all outstanding and unexpended appropriations there will remain near eleven million dollars to be applied to any new objects which congress may designate or to the more rapid execution of the works already in progress in aid of these objects and to satisfy the current expenditures of the ensuing year it is estimated that there will be received from various sources twenty million dollars more in eighteen thirty six should congress make new appropriations in conformity with the estimates which will be submitted from the proper departments amounting to about twenty four million dollars still the available surplus at the close of the next year after deducting all unexpended appropriations will probably not be less than six million dollars this sum can in my judgment be now usefully applied to proposed improvements in our navy yards and to new national works which are not enumerated in the present estimates or to the more rapid completion of those already begun either would be constitutional and useful and would render unnecessary any attempt in our present peculiar condition to divide the surplus revenue or to reduce it any faster than will be effected by the existing laws in any event as the annual report from the secretary of the treasury will enter into details showing the probability of some decrease in the revenue during the next seven years and a very considerable deduction in eighteen forty two it is not recommended that congress should undertake to modify the present tariff so as to disturb the principles on which the compromise act was passed taxation on some of the articles of general consumption which are not in competition with our own productions may be no doubt so diminished as to lessen to some extent the source of this revenue and the same object can also be assisted by more liberal provisions for the subjects of public defence which in the present state of our prosperity and wealth may be expected to engage your attention 
if however after satisfying all the demands which can arise from these sources the unexpended balance in the treasury should still continue to increase it would be better to bear with the evil until the great changes contemplated in our tariff laws have occurred and shall enable us to revise the system with that care and circumspection which are due to so delicate and important a subject it is certainly our duty to diminish as far as we can the burdens of taxation and to regard all the restrictions which are imposed on the trade and navigation of our citizens as evils which we shall mitigate whenever we are not prevented by the adverse legislation and policy of foreign nations or those primary duties which the defence and independence of our country enjoin upon us that we have accomplished much toward the relief of our citizens by the changes which have accompanied the payment of the public debt and the adoption of the present revenue laws is manifest from the fact that compared to eighteen thirty three there is a diminution of near twenty five million dollars in the last two years and that our expenditures independently of those for the public debt have been reduced near nine million dollars during the same period let us trust that by the continued observance of economy and by harmonizing the great interests of agriculture manufactures and commerce much more may be accomplished to diminish the burdens of government and to increase still further the enterprise and the patriotic affection of all classes of our citizens and all the members of our happy confederacy as the data which the secretary of the treasury will lay before you in regard to our financial resources are full and extended and will afford a safe guide in your future calculations i think it unnecessary to offer any further observations on that subject here among the evidences of the increasing prosperity of the country not the least gratifying is that afforded by the receipts from the sales of the public lands which amount in the present year to the unexpected sum of eleven million dollars this circumstance attests the rapidity with which agriculture the first and most important occupation of man advances and contributes to the wealth and power of our extended territory being still of the opinion that it is our best policy as far as we can consistently with the obligations under which those lands were ceded to the united states to promote their speedy settlement i beg leave to call the attention of the present congress to the suggestions i have offered respecting it in my former messages the extraordinary receipts from the sales of the public lands invite you to consider what improvements the land system and particularly the condition of the general land office may require at the time this institution was organized near a quarter century ago it would probably have been thought extravagant to anticipate for this period such an addition to its business as has been produced by the vast increase of those sales during the past and present years it may also be observed that since the year eighteen twelve the land offices and surveying districts have been greatly multiplied and that numerous legislative enactments from year to year since that time have imposed a great amount of new and additional duties upon that office while the want of a timely application of force commensurate with the care and labor required has caused the increasing embarrassment of accumulated arrears in the different branches of the establishment these impediments to the expedition of much duty in the general land office induce me to submit to your judgment whether some modification of the laws relating to its organization or an organization of a new character be not called for at the present juncture to enable the office to accomplish all the ends of its institution with a greater degree of facility and promptitude than experience has proved to be practicable under existing regulations the variety of the concerns and the magnitude and complexity of the details 
occupying and dividing the attention of the commissioner appear to render it difficult if not impracticable for that officer by any possible assiduity to bestow on all the multifarious subjects upon which he is called to act the ready and careful attention due to their respective importance unless the legislature shall assist him by a law providing or enabling him to provide for a more regular and economical distribution of labor with the incident responsibility among those employed under his direction the mere manual operation of affixing his signature to the vast number of documents issuing from his office subtracts so largely from the time and attention claimed by the weighty and complicated subjects daily accumulating in that branch of the public service as to indicate the strong necessity of revising the organic law of the establishment it will be easy for congress hereafter to proportion the expenditure on account of this branch of the service to its real wants by abolishing from time to time the offices which can be dispensed with the extinction of the public debt having taken place there is no longer any use for the offices of commissioners of loans and of the sinking fund i recommend therefore that they be abolished and that proper measures be taken for the transfer to the treasury department of any funds books and papers connected with the operations of those offices and that the proper power be given to that department for closing finally any portion of their business which may remain to be settled it is also incumbent on congress in guarding the pecuniary interests of the country to discontinue by such a law as was passed in eighteen twelve the receipt of the bills of the bank of the united states in payment of the public revenue and to provide for the designation of an agent whose duty it shall be to take charge of the books and stock of the united states in that institution and to close all connection with it after the third of march eighteen thirty three when its charter expires in making provision in regard to the disposition of this stock it will be essential to define clearly and strictly the duties and powers of the officer charged with that branch of the public service it will be seen from the correspondence which the secretary of the treasury will lay before you that notwithstanding the large amount of the stock which the united states hold in that institution no information has yet been communicated which will enable the government to anticipate when it can receive any dividends or derive any benefit from it connected with the condition of the finances and the flourishing state of the country in all its branches of industry it is pleasing to witness the advantages which have been already derived from the recent laws regulating the value of the gold coinage these advantages will be more apparent in the course of the next year when the branch mints authorized to be established in north carolina georgia and louisiana shall have gone into operation aided as it is hoped they will be by further reforms in the banking systems of the states and by judicious regulations on the part of congress in relation to the custody of the public moneys it may be confidently anticipated that the use of gold and silver as circulating medium will become general in the ordinary transactions connected with the labor of the country the great desideratum in modern times is an efficient check upon the power of banks preventing that excessive issue of paper whence arise those fluctuations in the standard of value which render uncertain the rewards of labor it was supposed by those who established the bank of the united states that from the credit given to it by the custody of the public moneys and other privileges and the precautions taken to guard against the evils which the country had suffered in the bankruptcy of many of the state institutions of that period we should derive from that institution all the security and benefits of a sound currency and every good end that was attainable under the provision of the constitution which authorizes congress alone to coin money and regulate the value thereof but it is scarcely necessary now to say that these anticipations have not been realized 
after the extensive embarrassment and distress recently produced by the bank of the united states from which the country is now recovering aggravated as they were by pretensions to power which defied the public authority and which if acquiesced in by the people would have changed the whole character of our government every candid and intelligent individual must admit that for the attainment of the great advantages of a sound currency we must look to a course of legislation radically different from that which created such an institution in considering the means of obtaining so important an end we must set aside all calculations of temporary convenience and be influenced by those only which are in harmony with the true character and the permanent interests of the republic we must recur to first principles and see what it is that has prevented the legislation of congress and the states on the subject of currency from satisfying the public expectation and realizing results corresponding to those which have attended the action of our system when truly consistent with the great principle of equality upon which it rests and with that spirit of forbearance and mutual concession and generous patriotism which was originally and must ever continue to be the vital element of our union on this subject i am sure that i cannot be mistaken in ascribing our want of success to the undue countenance which has been afforded to the spirit of monopoly all the serious dangers which our system has yet encountered may be traced to the resort to implied powers and the use of corporations clothed with privileges the effect of which is to advance the interests of the few at the expense of the many we have felt but one class of these dangers exhibited in the contest waged by the bank of the united states against the government for the last four years happily they have been obviated for the present by the indignant resistance of the people but we should recollect that the principle whence they sprung is an ever active one which will not fail to renew its efforts in the same and in other forms so long as there is a hope of success founded either on the inattention of the people or the treachery of their representatives to the subtle progress of its influence the bank is in fact but one of the fruits of a system at war with the genius of all our institutions a system founded upon a political creed the fundamental principle of which is a distrust of the popular will as a safe regulator of political power and whose great ultimate object and inevitable result should it prevail is the consolidation of all power in our system in one central government lavish public disbursements and corporations with exclusive privileges would be its substitutes for the original and as yet sound checks and balances of the constitution the means by whose silent and secret operation a control would be exercised by the few over the political conduct of the many by first acquiring that control over the labor and earnings of the great body of the people wherever this spirit has effected an alliance with political power tyranny and despotism have been the fruit if it is ever used for the ends of government it has to be incessantly watched or it corrupts the sources of the public virtue and agitates the country with questions unfavorable to the harmonious and steady pursuit of its true interests we are now to see whether in the present favorable condition of the country we cannot take an effectual stand against the spirit of monopoly and practically prove in respect to the currency as well as other important interests that there is no necessity for so extensive a resort to it as that which has been heretofore practised the experience of another year has confirmed the utter fallacy of the idea that the bank of the united states was necessary as a fiscal agent of the government without its aid as such indeed in despite of all the embarrassment it was in its power to create the revenue has been paid with punctuality by our citizens the business of exchange both foreign and domestic has been conducted with convenience and the circulating medium has been greatly improved 
by the use of the state banks which do not derive their charters from the general government and are not controlled by its authority it is ascertained that the moneys of the united states can be collected and dispersed without loss or inconvenience and that all the wants of the community in relation to exchange and currency are supplied as well as they have ever been before if under circumstances the most unfavorable to the steadiness of the money market it has been found that the considerations on which the bank of the united states rested its claims to the public favor were imaginary and groundless it cannot be doubted that the experience of the future will be more decisive against them it has been seen that without the agency of a great moneyed monopoly the revenue can be collected and conveniently and safely applied to all the purposes of the public expenditure it is also ascertained that instead of being necessarily made to promote the evils of an unchecked paper system the management of the revenue can be made auxiliary to the reform which the legislatures of several of the states have already commenced in regard to the suppression of small bills and which has only to be fostered by proper regulations on the part of congress to secure a practical return to the extent required for the security of the currency to the constitutional medium severed from the government as political engines and not susceptible of dangerous extension and combination the state banks will not be tempted nor will they have the power which we have seen exercised to divert the public funds from the legitimate purposes of the government the collection and custody of the revenue being on the contrary a source of credit to them will increase the security which the states provide for a faithful execution of their trusts by multiplying the scrutinies to which their operations and accounts will be subjected thus disposed as well from interest as the obligations of their charters it cannot be doubted that such conditions as congress may see fit to adopt respecting the deposits in these institutions with a view to the gradual disuse of the small bills will be cheerfully complied with and that we shall soon gain in place of the bank of the united states a practical reform in the whole paper system of the country if by this policy we can ultimately witness the suppression of all bank bills below twenty dollars it is apparent that gold and silver will take their place and become the principal circulating medium in the common business of the farmers and mechanics of the country the attainment of such a result will form an era in the history of our country which will be dwelt upon with delight by every true friend of its liberty and independence it will lighten the great tax which our paper system has so long collected from the earnings of labor and do more to revive and perpetuate those habits of economy and simplicity which are so congenial to the character of republicans than all the legislation which has yet been attempted to this subject i feel that i cannot too earnestly invite the special attention of congress without the exercise of whose authority the opportunity to accomplish so much public good must pass unimproved deeply impressed with its vital importance the executive has taken all the steps within his constitutional power to guard the public revenue and defeat the expectation which the bank of the united states indulged of renewing and perpetuating its monopoly on the ground of its necessity as a fiscal agent and as affording a sounder currency than could be obtained without such an institution in the performance of this duty much responsibility was incurred which would have been gladly avoided if the stake which the public had in the question could have been otherwise preserved although clothed with the legal authority and supported by precedent i was aware that there was in the act of the removal of the deposits a liability to excite that sensitiveness to executive power which it is characteristic and the duty of free men to indulge but i relied on this feeling also directed by patriotism and intelligence to vindicate the conduct which in the end would appear to have been called for by the interests of my country the apprehensions natural to this feeling that there may have been a desire through the instrumentality of that measure to extend the executive influence or that it may have been prompted by motives not sufficiently free from ambition were not overlooked 
under the operation of our institutions the public servant who is called on to take a step of high responsibility should feel in the freedom which gives rise to such apprehensions his highest security when unfounded the attention which they arouse and the discussions they excite deprive those who indulge them of the power to do harm when just they but hasten the certainty with which the great body of our citizens never fail to repel an attempt to procure the sanction to any exercise of power inconsistent with the jealous maintenance of their rights under such convictions and entertaining no doubt that my constitutional obligations demanded the steps which were taken in reference to the removal of the deposits it was impossible for me to be deterred from the path of duty by a fear that my motives could be misjudged or that political prejudices could defeat the just consideration of the merits of my conduct the result has shown how safe is this reliance upon the patriotic temper and enlightened discernment of the people that measure has now been before them and has stood the test of all the severe analysis which its general importance the interests it affected and the apprehensions it excited were calculated to produce and it now remains for congress to consider what legislation has become necessary in consequence i need only add to what i have on former occasions said on this subject generally that in the regulations which congress may prescribe respecting the custody of the public moneys it is desirable that as little discretion as may be deemed consistent with their safekeeping should be given to the executive agents no one can be more deeply impressed than i am with the soundness of the doctrine which restrains and limits by specific provisions executive discretion as far as it can be done consistently with the preservation of its constitutional character in respect to the control over the public money this doctrine is peculiarly applicable and is in harmony with the great principle which i felt i was sustaining in the controversy with the bank of the united states which has resulted in severing to some extent a dangerous connection between a moneyed and political power the duty of the legislature to define by clear and positive enactments the nature and extent of the action which it belongs to the executive to superintend springs out of a policy analogous to that which enjoins upon all branches of the federal government an abstinence from the exercise of powers not clearly granted in such a government possessing only limited and specific powers the spirit of its general administration cannot be wise or just when it opposes the reference of all doubtful points to the great source of authority the states and the people whose number and diversified relations securing them against the influences and excitements which may mislead their agents make them the safest depository of power in its application to the executive with reference to the legislative branch of the government the same rule of action should make the president ever anxious to avoid the exercise of any discretionary authority which can be regulated by congress the biases which may operate upon him will not be so likely to extend to the representatives of the people in that body in my former messages to congress i have repeatedly urged the propriety of lessening the discretionary authority lodged in the various departments but it has produced no effect as yet except the discontinuance of extra allowances in the army and navy and the substitution of fixed salaries in the latter it is believed that the same principles could be advantageously applied in all cases and would promote the efficiency and economy of the public service at the same time that greater satisfaction and more equal justice would be secured to the public officers generally the accompanying report of the secretary of war will put you in possession of the operations of the department confided to his care in all its diversified relations during the past year 
i am gratified in being able to inform you that no occurrence has required any movement of the military force except such as is common to a state of peace the services of the army have been limited to their usual duties at the various garrisons upon the atlantic and inland frontier with the exceptions stated by the secretary of war our small military establishment appears to be adequate to the purposes for which it is maintained and it forms a nucleus around which any additional force may be collected should the public exigencies unfortunately require any increase of our military means End of section sixteen Section 17 of State of the Union Addresses, 1829 to 1836. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Andrew Jackson, December 5th, 1836. Part 1. Fellow citizens of the Senate and of the House of Representatives, addressing to you the last annual message i shall ever present to the congress of the united states it is a source of the most heartfelt satisfaction to be able to congratulate you on the high state of prosperity which our beloved country has attained with no causes at home or abroad to lessen the confidence with which we look to the future for continuing proofs of the capacity of our free institutions to produce all the fruits of good government the general condition of our affairs may well excite our national pride i cannot avoid congratulating you and my country particularly on the success of the efforts made during my administration by the executive and legislature in conformity with the sincere constant and earnest desire of the people to maintain peace and establish cordial relations with all foreign powers our gratitude is due to the supreme ruler of the universe and i invite you to unite with me in offering to him fervent supplications that his providential care may ever be extended to those who follow us, enabling them to avoid the dangers and the horrors of war, consistently with a just and indispensable regard to the rights and honor of our country. But although the present state of our foreign affairs, standing without important change, as they did when you separated in July last, is flattering in the extreme, I regret to say that many questions of an interesting character at issue with other powers are yet unadjusted. Amongst the most prominent of these is that of our northeast boundary. With an undiminished confidence in the sincere desire of His Britannic Majesty's government to adjust that question, I am not yet in possession of the precise grounds upon which it proposes a satisfactory adjustment. With France, our diplomatic relations have been resumed, and under circumstances which attest the disposition of both governments to preserve a mutually beneficial intercourse and foster those amicable feelings which are so strongly required by the true interests of the two countries. With Russia, Austria, Prussia, Naples, Sweden, and Denmark, the best understanding exists, and our commercial intercourse is gradually expanding itself with them. It is encouraged in all these countries, except Naples, by their mutually advantageous and liberal treaty stipulations with us. The claims of our citizens on Portugal are admitted to be just, but provision for the payment of them has been unfortunately delayed by frequent political changes in that kingdom the blessings of peace have not been secured by spain 
our connections with that country are on the best footing with the exception of the burdens still imposed upon our commerce with her possessions out of europe the claims of american citizens for losses sustained at the bombardment of antwerp have been presented to the governments of holland and belgium and will be pressed in due season to settlement with brazil and all our neighbors of this continent we continue to maintain relations of amity and concord extending our commerce with them as far as the resources of the people and the policy of their governments will permit the just and long-standing claims of our citizens upon some of them are yet sources of dissatisfaction and complaint no danger is apprehended however that they will not be peacefully although tardily acknowledged and paid by all unless the irritating effect of her struggle with texas should unfortunately make our immediate neighbor mexico an exception it is already known to you by the correspondence between the two governments communicated at your last session that our conduct in relation to that struggle is regulated by the same principles that governed us in the dispute between spain and mexico herself and i trust that it will be found on the most severe scrutiny that our acts have strictly corresponded with our professions that the inhabitants of the united states should feel strong prepossessions for the one party is not surprising but this circumstance should of itself teach us great caution lest it lead us into the great error of suffering public policy to be regulated by partiality or prejudice and there are considerations connected with the possible result of this contest between the two parties of so much delicacy and importance to the united states that our character requires that we should neither anticipate events nor attempt to control them the known desire of the texans to become a part of our system although its gratification depends upon the reconcilement of various and conflicting interests necessarily a work of time and uncertain in itself is calculated to expose our conduct to misconstruction in the eyes of the world there are already those who indifferent to principle themselves and prone to suspect the want of it in others charge us with ambitious designs and insidious policy you will perceive by the accompanying documents that the extraordinary mission from mexico has been terminated on the sole ground that the obligations of this government to itself and to mexico under treaty stipulations have compelled me to trust a discretionary authority to a high officer of our army to advance into territory claimed as part of texas if necessary to protect our own or the neighboring frontier from indian depredation in the opinion of the mexican functionary who has just left us the honor of his country will be wounded by american soldiers entering with the most amicable avowed purposes upon ground from which the followers of his government have been expelled and over which there is at present no certainty of a serious effort on its part to re-establish its dominion the departure of this minister was the more singular as he was apprised that the sufficiency of the causes assigned for the advance of our troops by the commanding general had been seriously doubted by me and there was every reason to suppose that the troops of the united states their commander having had time to ascertain the truth or falsehood of the information upon which they had marched to nagadoches would be either there in perfect accordance with the principles admitted to be just in his conference with the secretary of state by the mexican minister himself 
or were already withdrawn in consequence of the impressive warnings their commanding officer had received from the department of war it is hoped and believed that his government will take a more dispassionate and just view of this subject and not be disposed to construe a measure of justifiable precaution made necessary by its known inability in execution of the stipulations of our treaty to act upon the frontier into an encroachment upon its rights or a stain upon its honor in the meantime the ancient complaints of injustice made on behalf of our citizens are disregarded and new causes of dissatisfaction have arisen some of them of a character requiring prompt remonstrance and ample and immediate redress i trust however by tempering firmness with courtesy and acting with great forbearance upon every incident that has occurred or that may happen to do and to obtain justice and thus avoid the necessity of again bringing this subject to the view of congress it is my duty to remind you that no provision has been made to execute our treaty with mexico for tracing the boundary line between the two countries whatever may be the prospect of mexico's being soon able to execute the treaty on its part it is proper that we should be in anticipation prepared at all times to perform our obligations without regard to the probable condition of those with whom we have contracted them the result of the confidential inquiries made into the condition and prospects of the newly declared texan government will be communicated to you in the course of the session commercial treaties promising great advantages to our enterprising merchants and navigators have been formed with the distant governments of musket and siam the ratifications have been exchanged but have not reached the department of state copies of the treaties will be transmitted to you if received before or published if arriving after the close of the present session of congress nothing has occurred to interrupt the good understanding that has long existed with the barbary powers nor to check the good will which is gradually growing up from our intercourse with the dominions of the government of growing of the distinguished chief of the ottoman empire information has been received at the department of state that a treaty with the emperor of morocco has just been negotiated which i hope will be received in time to be laid before the senate previous to the close of the session you will perceive from the report of the secretary of the treasury that the financial means of the country continue to keep pace with its improvement in all other respects the receipts into the treasury during the present year will amount to about forty seven million six hundred and ninety one thousand eight hundred and ninety eight dollars those from customs being estimated at twenty two million five hundred and twenty three thousand one hundred and fifty one dollars those from lands at about twenty four million dollars and the residue from miscellaneous sources the expenditures for all objects during the year are estimated not to exceed thirty two million dollars which will leave a balance in the treasury for public purposes on the first day of january next of about forty one million seven hundred and twenty three thousand nine hundred and fifty nine dollars the sum with the exception of five million dollars will be transferred to the several states in accordance with the provisions of the act regulating the deposits of the public money the unexpected balances of appropriation on the first day of january next are estimated at fourteen million six hundred and thirty six thousand and sixty two dollars exceeding by nine million six hundred and thirty six thousand sixty two dollars the amount which will be left in the deposit banks 
subject to the draft of the treasurer of the united states after the contemplated transfers to the several states are made if therefore the future receipts should not be sufficient to meet these outstanding and future appropriations there may be soon a necessity to use a portion of the funds deposited with the states the consequences apprehended when the deposit act of the last session received a reluctant approval have been measurably realized though an act merely for the deposit of the surplus monies of the united states in the state treasuries for safe keeping until they may be wanted for the service of the general government it has been extensively spoken of as an act to give the money to the several states and they have been advised to use it as a gift without regard to the means of refunding it when called for such a suggestion has doubtless been made without a proper attention to the various principles and interests which are affected by it it is manifest that the law itself cannot sanction such a suggestion and that as it now stands the states have no more authority to receive and use the deposits without intending to return them than any deposit bank or any individual temporarily charged with the safe keeping or application of the public money would now have for converting the same to their private use without the consent and against the will of the government but independently of the violation of public faith and moral obligation which are involved in this suggestion when examined in reference to the terms of the present deposit act it is believed that the considerations which should govern the future legislation of congress on this subject will be equally conclusive against the adoption of any measure recognizing the principles on which the suggestion has been made considering the intimate connection of the subject with the financial interests of the country and its great importance in whatever aspect it can be viewed i have bestowed upon it the most anxious reflection and feel it to be my duty to state to congress such thoughts as have occurred to me to aid their deliberation in treating it in the manner best calculated to conduce to the common good the experience of other nations admonished us to hasten the extinguishment of the public debt but it will be in vain that we have congratulated each other upon the disappearance of this evil if we do not guard against the equally great one of promoting the unnecessary accumulation of public revenue no political maxim is better established than that which tells us that an improvident expenditure of money is the parent of profligacy and that no people can hope to perpetuate their liberties who long acquiesce in a policy which taxes them for objects not necessary to the legitimate and real wants of their government flattering as is the condition of our country at the present period because of its unexampled advance in all the steps of social and political improvement it cannot be disguised that there is a lurking danger already apparent in the neglect of this warning truth and that the time has arrived when the representatives of the people should be employed in devising some more appropriate remedy than now exists to avert it under our present revenue system there is every probability that there will continue to be a surplus beyond the wants of the government and it has become our duty to decide whether such a result be consistent with the true objects of our government should a surplus be permitted to accumulate beyond the appropriations it must be retained in the treasury as it now is or distributed among the people or the states to retain it in the treasury unemployed in any way is impracticable it is besides against the genius of our free institutions to lock up in vaults the treasure of the nation 
to take from the people the right of bearing arms and put their weapons of defense in the hands of a standing army would be scarcely more dangerous to their liberties than to permit the government to accumulate immense amount of treasure beyond the supplies necessary to its legitimate wants such a treasure would doubtless be employed at some time as it has been in other countries when opportunity tempted ambition to collect it merely for distribution to the states would seem to be highly impolitic if not as dangerous as the proposition to retain it in the treasury the shortest reflection must satisfy every one that to require the people to pay taxes to the government merely that they may be paid back again is sporting with the substantial interests of the country and no system which produces such a result can be expected to receive the public countenance nothing could be gained by it even if each individual who contributed a portion of the tax could receive back promptly the same portion but it is apparent that no system of the kind can ever be enforced which will not absorb a considerable portion of the money to be distributed in salaries and commissions to the agents employed in the process and in the various losses and deprecations which arise from other causes and the practical effect of such an attempt must ever be to burden the people with taxes not for purposes beneficial to them but to swell the profits of deposit banks and support a band of useless public officers a distribution to the people is impracticable and unjust in other respects it would be taking one man's property and giving it to another such would be the unavoidable result of a rule of equality and none other is spoken of or would be likely to be adopted inasmuch as there is no mode by which the amount of the individual contributions of our citizens to the public revenue can be ascertained we know that they contribute unequally and a rule therefore that would distribute to them equally would be liable to all the objections which apply to the principle of an equal division of property to make the general government the instrument of carrying this odious principle into effect would be at once to destroy the means of its usefulness and change the character designed for it by the framers of the constitution but the more extended and injurious consequences likely to result from a policy which would collect a surplus revenue for the purpose of distributing it may be forcibly illustrated by an examination of the effects already produced by the present deposit act this act although certainly designed to secure the safe keeping of the public revenue is not entirely free in its tendencies from any of the objections which apply to this principle of distribution the government had without necessity received from the people a large surplus which, instead of being employed as heretofore and returned to them by means of the public expenditure, was deposited with sundry banks. The banks proceeded to make loans upon this surplus, and thus converted it into banking capital, and in this manner it has tended to multiply bank charters, and has had a great agency in producing a spirit of wild speculation the possession and use of the property out of which this surplus was created belonged to the people but the government has transferred its possession to incorporated banks whose interest and effort is to make large profits out of its use this process need only be stated to show its injustice and bad policy and the same observations apply to the influence which is produced by the steps necessary to collect as well as to distribute such a revenue about three-fifths of all the duties on imports are paid in the city of new york but it is obvious that the means to pay those duties are drawn from every quarter of the union every citizen in every state who purchases and consumes an article which has paid a duty at that port contributes 
to the accumulating mass the surplus collected there must therefore be made up of monies or property withdrawn from other points and other states thus the wealth and business of every region from which these surplus funds proceed must be to some extent injured while that of the place where the funds are concentrated and are employed in banking are proportionably extended but both in the making the transfer of the funds which are first necessary to pay the duties and collect the surplus and in making the retransfer which becomes necessary when the time arrives for the distribution of that surplus there is a considerable period when the funds cannot be brought into use and it is manifest that besides the loss inevitable from such an operation its tendency is to produce fluctuations in the business of the country which are always productive of speculation and detrimental to the interests of regular trade argument can scarcely be necessary to show that a measure of this character ought not to receive further legislative encouragement by examining the practical operation of the ration for distribution adopted in the deposit bill of the last session we shall discover other features that appear equally objectionable let it be assumed for the sake of argument that the surplus monies to be deposited with the states have been collected and belong to them in the ration of their federal representative population an assumption founded upon the fact that any deficiencies in our future revenue from imposts and public lands must be made up by direct taxes collected from the states in that ration it is proposed to distribute this surplus say thirty million dollars not according to the ration in which it has been collected and belongs to the people of the states but in that of their votes in the colleges of electors of president and vice president the effect of a distribution upon that ration is shown by the annexed table marked a by an examination of that table it will be perceived that in the distribution of a surplus of thirty million dollars upon that basis there is a great departure from the principle which regards representation as the true measure of taxation and it will be found that the tendency of that departure will be to increase whatever inequalities have been supposed to attend the operation of our federal system in respect to its bearings upon the different interests of the union in making the basis of representation the basis of taxation the framers of the constitution intended to equalize the burdens which are necessary to support the government and the adoption of that ratio while it accomplished this object was also the means of adjusting other great topics arising out of the conflicting views respecting the political equality of the various members of the confederacy whatever therefore disturbs the liberal spirit of the compromises which established a rule of taxation so just and equitable and which experience has proved to be so well adapted to the genius and habits of our people should be received with the greatest caution and distrust a bare inspection in the annexed table of the differences produced by the ration used in the deposit act compared with the results of a distribution according to the ration of direct taxation must satisfy every unprejudiced mind that the former ration contravenes the spirit of the constitution and produces a degree of injustice in the operations of the federal government which would be fatal to the hope of perpetuating it by the ration of direct taxation for example the state of delaware in the collection of thirty million dollars of revenue would pay into the treasury one hundred and eighty eight thousand seven hundred and sixteen dollars and in a distribution of thirty million dollars she would receive back from the government according to the ration of the deposit bill the sum of three hundred and six thousand 
one hundred and twenty two dollars and similar results would follow the comparison between the small and the large states throughout the union thus realizing to the small states an advantage which would be doubtless as unacceptable to them as a motive for incorporating the principle in any system which would produce it as it would be inconsistent with the rights and expectations of the large states it was certainly the intention of that provision of the constitution which declares that all duties imposts and excises shall be uniform throughout the united states to make the burdens of taxation fall equally upon the people in whatever state of the union they may reside but what would be the value of such a uniform rule if the monies raised by it could be immediately returned by a different one which will give to the people of some states much more and to those of others much less than their fair proportions were the federal government to exempt in express terms the imports products and manufacturers of some portions of the country from all duties while it imposed heavy ones on others the injustice could not be greater it would be easy to show how by the operation of such a principle the large states of the union would not only have to contribute their just share toward the support of the federal government but also have to bear in some degree the taxes necessary to support the governments of their smaller sisters but it is deemed unnecessary to state the details where the general principle is so obvious a system liable to such objections can never be supposed to have been sanctioned by the framers of the constitution when they conferred on congress the taxing power and i feel persuaded that a mature examination of the subject will satisfy every one that there are insurmountable difficulties in the operation of any plan which can be devised of collecting revenue for the purpose of distributing it congress is only authorized to levy taxes to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the united states there is no such provision as would authorize congress to collect together the property of the country under the name of revenue for the purpose of dividing it equally or unequally among the states or the people indeed it is not probable that such an idea ever occurred to the states when they adopted the constitution but however this may be the only safe rule for us in interpreting the powers granted to the federal government is to regard the absence of express authority to touch a subject so important and delicate as this as equivalent to a prohibition even if our powers were less doubtful in this respect as the constitution now stands there are considerations afforded by recent experience which would seem to make it our duty to avoid a resort to such a system all will admit that the simplicity and economy of the state governments mainly depend on the fact that money has to be supplied to support them by the same men or their agents who voted away in appropriations hence when there are extravagant and wasteful appropriations there must be a corresponding increase of taxes and the people becoming awakened will necessarily scrutinize the character of measures which thus increase their burdens by the watchful eye of self-interest the agents of the people in the state governments are repressed and kept within the limits of a just economy but if the necessity of levying the taxes be taken from those who make the appropriations and thrown upon a more distant and less responsible set of public agents who have power to approach the people by an indirect and stealthy taxation there is reason to fear that prodigality will soon supersede those characteristics which have thus far made us look with so much pride and confidence to the state governments as the mainstay of our union and liberties the state legislatures instead of studying to restrict their state expenditures to the smallest possible sum 
will claim credit for their profusion and harass the general government for increased supplies practically there would soon be but one taxing power and that vested in a body of men far removed from the people in which the farming and mechanic interests would scarcely be represented the states would gradually lose their purity as well as their independence they would not dare to murmur at the proceedings of the general government lest they should lose their supplies all would be merged in a practical consolidation cemented by widespread corruption which could only be eradicated by one of those bloody revolutions which occasionally overthrow the despotic systems of the old world in all the other aspects in which i have been able to look at the effect of such a principle of distribution upon the best interests of the country i can see nothing to compensate for the disadvantages to which i have adverted if we consider the protective duties which are in a great degree the source of the surplus revenue beneficial to one section of the union and prejudicial to another there is no corrective for the evil in such a plan of distribution on the contrary there is reason to fear that all the complaints which have sprung from this cause would be aggravated every one must be sensible that a distribution of the surplus must be yet a disposition to cherish the means which create it and any system therefore into which it enters must have a powerful tendency to increase rather than diminish the tariff if it were even admitted that the advantages of such a system could be made equal to all the sections of the union the reasons already so urgently calling for a reduction of the revenue would nevertheless lose none of their force for it will always be improbable that an intelligent and virtuous community can consent to raise a surplus for the mere purpose of dividing it diminished as it must inevitably be by the expenses of the various machinery necessary to the process the safest and simplest mode of obviating all the difficulties which have been mentioned is to collect only revenue enough to meet the wants of the government and let the people keep the balance of their property in their own hands to be used for their own profit each state will then support its own government and contribute its due share toward the support of the general government there would be no surplus to cramp and lessen the resources of individual wealth and enterprise and the banks would be left to their ordinary means whatever agitations and fluctuations might arise from our unfortunate paper system they could never be attributed justly or unjustly to the action of the federal government there would be some guarantee that the spirit of wild speculation which seeks to convert the surplus revenue into banking capital would be effectually checked and that the scenes of demoralization which are now so prevalent through the land would disappear without desiring to conceal that the experience and observation of the last two years have operated a partial change in my views upon this interesting subject it is nevertheless regretted that the suggestions made by me in my annual messages of eighteen twenty nine and eighteen thirty have been greatly misunderstood at that time the great struggle was begun against the latitudinarian construction of the constitution which authorizes the unlimited appropriation of the revenues of the union to internal improvements within the states tending to invest in the hands and place under the control of the general government all the principal roads and canals of the country in violation of state rights and in derogation of state authority at the same time the condition of the manufacturing interest was such as to create an apprehension that the duties on imports could not without extensive mischief be reduced in season to prevent the accumulation of a considerable surplus after the payment of the national debt 
in view of the dangers of such a surplus and in preference to its application to internal improvements in derogation of the rights and powers of the states the suggestion of an amendment of the constitution to authorize its distribution was made it was an alternative for what were deemed greater evils a temporary resort to relieve an overburdened treasury until the government could without a sudden and destructive revulsion in the business of the country gradually return to the just principle of raising no more revenue from the people in taxes than is necessary for its economical support even that alternative was not spoken of but in connection with an amendment of the constitution no temporary inconvenience can justify the exercise of a prohibited power not granted by that instrument and it was from a conviction that the power to distribute even a temporary surplus of revenue is of that character that it was suggested only in connection with an appeal to the source of all legal power in the general government the states which have established it no such appeal has been taken and in my opinion a distribution of the surplus revenue by congress either to the states or to the people is to be considered as among the prohibitions of the constitution as already intimated my views have undergone a change so far as to be convinced that no alteration of the constitution in this respect is wise or expedient the influence of an accumulating surplus upon the credit system of the country producing dangerous extensions and ruinous contractions fluctuations in the price of property rash speculation idleness extravagance and a deterioration of morals have taught us the important lesson that any transient mischief which may attend the reduction of our revenue to the wants of our government is to be borne in preference to an overflowing treasury End of section 17.